Yes, so hello everybody and hello to Yuda and, uh, and, and his friends and family that are here. Uh, my name's uh, Robert Holty from the University of Alberta and uh, I don't actually have any real personal or professional connection with Yuda. He's probably long forgotten that we drank wine at, uh, uh, I think it was Ikai 1986. It was a very hot August in Orsay and uh, you were entertaining us at the time and predicting that he would be famous. So I w am impressed today to report back that uh, you were right. Uh, and, in, and in fact, some of the, uh, the main message that, uh, that I'm sending is not about the technical brilliance of his contributions or anything, but about the visionary, uh, the vision that he had in 1984 that has actually come to pass. Uh, the title of, um, of this presentation here on the slide won't mean anything to too many of you, I don't think. You have to have read this book in order to know where that title came from. And so I'll get back to that in a minute or two. Uh, but um, I want to also thank, of course, the, the organizers for inviting me to uh, have a chance to speak here and, uh, and uh, to have uh, me and Jonathan Schaefer and Ariel Fellner make a joint contribution to the book itself. Um, I want to give you a, a brief history. Uh, this is a sort of according to DBLP. I didn't actually look you through your full CV, but uh, your history begins in 1975 on DBLP. So there's obviously a prehistory there that I don't know anything about. Uh, but um, in fact, one of the early papers that I read by you know, was on rate distortion theory applied to AI-ish problems. You've probably long forgotten that you even did that work, but it's actually quite interesting. And uh, one day we'll have a technical discussion about how tight those bounds are, because it's a very interesting kind of theory, and some of the results themselves were interesting. Uh, <clears throat> there's a real gap on DBLP between 1970 and 1980, and I assume that that's because you were off seeking enlightenment, uh, because what happened next, of course, was the most important thing, is that you discovered heuristic search. And it's actually quite remarkable how quickly you came to completely master the subject and make, and make deep technical contributions uh, that they'd been, problems had been sitting there for 20 years, and uh, there you were, you stepped in and, and took it over. I'm always wondering if Rena had something to do with this, but that's a, a comment we can maybe get to at lunch. And then after 1984, well, things sort of went off, off, off the rails, and uh, other people will be talking about that. So I, for me, the golden age was 1980 to 1984. And, uh, um, and this book uh, is the consequence uh, or the crowning glory, the magnum opus of the golden age uh, from uh, the heuristic search point of view. And even today, uh, I reference it all the time in the graduate courses that I teach on heuristic search. Every year I teach a course and every year I just open up the first few, page, uh, first few chapters and that is the touchstone text that I still use to this day. If you haven't read it, then um, it has all those amazing qualities that we've already heard people talk about for Avuda. It is, uh, first and foremost, a piece of s true scholarship. The bibliographical information that's at the end of every chapter is a complete history of the topics that are covered in that chapter, and it's almost the best history of the topics that I've read. And so, again, I'm constantly going back to that. When you want the history of AI, you can get it uh, when it comes to heuristic search from this book here. It's also technically immaculate. The proofs are really correct and the theorems are really true and uh, he doesn't uh, paraphrase the theorems in an inaccurate way so that people get misled about what's really been shown and the accuracy of the book is, 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 uh, is also exemplary. And the thing that's most remarkable is that in a highly technical book you can make it accessible. It was a goal you set for yourself when you wrote the book and you were 100% successful. This is probably the most accessible and yet technical book that, that, that one can imagine. So anyway, the book is fantastic and uh, still available on the used book market, by the way, for about $50. So uh, I'm surprised there aren't some here for sale. You could have raised a little money here if you'd uh, thought ahead a little bit. Uh, so um, I, focused in, I focus in on chapter four of the book, uh, and this is where the title of our presentation comes from, because this was the one part of the book which was really conjectural or speculative. The rest of it was full of theorems and definitions and very nice treatment of technical topics. But this chapter stands out from the rest because it's not that way. This is a vision of how things might be done in the future. And we all, I think everyone, not even only the heuristic search people, know that this idea is a, is a very, very profound idea. And it, and, but we didn't know at the time whether it would work or not. So the idea is to view heuristic functions uh, as information that one gleans from a simplified model. And there's, um, the two main sections are the use uh, in the chapter are the use of relaxed models, which uh, Hector alluded to earlier. And the second one is this um, 
funny title, The Mechanical Generation of Admissible Heuristics. And I thought since Yuda has moved on to other things since the golden era, that I should bring you up to date on where things stand. So um, <clears throat> five years later, uh, Armin Perditis was working on his PhD thesis, and they were immediately inspired. I actually checked this with them. They were directly inspired by the chapter four to go off and implement the ideas that you had in there. And that took them a few years to implement it. Uh, Armand at some point was introduced to you as the guy who's implementing chapter four. And so, and that's what he did. He implemented chapter four. He broadened the scope of it. They had a large library of what they call abstraction transformations, which is a generalization of the idea of relaxed models. And speed up transformations, which is the part of the, the, the a key part of the idea that doesn't show up in the title of those sections, but the idea that not any old relaxation will do. It has to be a relaxation in which things can be computed efficiently. And so those are what Armand and Mostel called speed up transformations. And the nice thing is, first implementation, and it really worked. It was applied to 13 domains and found uh, effective heuristics for six of them, and five of them were novel heuristics that humans hadn't spotted, even though these were commonplace problems. So it really worked, and that was in 1989. Kind of the bad part from a historical point of view is that even then, the message fell on deaf ears. It was not that the whole rest of the scientific community picked up on the Perditis and Mostel work. Um, it took uh, Jonathan Schaefer and Joe Culberson to reinvent one of the key ideas here, but it's the same old idea. It's using heuristics gleaned from simplified models. Um, they gave them the name pattern databases, and they first applied them to the 15 puzzle. And this is where things began to take off. This is the beginning of the modern era of heuristic search, uh, because they applied it to the problems people were interested in, these toy puzzles that people are interested in that community, and they knocked the socks off existing methods. And I think that, that it was cemented for posterity when Rich Korf took the same pattern database idea and applied it to Rubik's Cube. And for the very first time, AI search techniques could find optimal solutions to arbitrarily, uh, to randomly generated um, solvable Rubik's Cube problems. And so that, was, that has cemented it in history as an idea that will last forever in AI. Um, so where are we today? Skipping along the timeline here, just so you know, if you come back into the community where you'll have to start from, things are looking good. Uh, abstraction, which is what we, this is the general idea of, of relaxation, abstraction-based heuristics, absolutely ubiquitous. You really can't pick up uh, hardly any heuristic search paper now without having these kinds of heuristics in there. And uh, thanks to Hector Geffner, really, he, he revolutionized the planning community to revisit planning as heuristic search. And the heuristics, as he mentioned in his own talk, the heuristics are derived through abstraction-based techniques. And so it's just every paper, not every paper, but almost every paper you open it will be this way. The sad part is that the idea of generating effective heuristics mechanically, completely automatically, is still on the agenda. 25 years later, what has been done is section 4.1 is now behind us. Okay, we have many ways of doing relaxation that are very effective. We know they're good ideas. So we've really focused on section 4.1 up till for the last 25 years. So in the next 25 years, we have the harder problem, as you recognized at the time, the harder problem is to search through the space of possible relaxations or abstractions and find the ones that are really the good ones. So that remains to be done, and, but there is some work on it, and, um, there, but there's plenty left to do. The very good news is that there's a vibrant and growing research community that is working on these problems. And it's not just old duffers like me, but there's enthusiastic participation from the next generation. And that's what you really need to have ideas live on uh, beyond one's own time, is that the next generation recognizes the value of them and carries them on. So I'm sort of half a next generation after you. And the next generation is way younger than me. And so this idea has now got um, momentum that will carry it forward, I, I would say, for 20, 50 years. So your vision has become a reality. It's here to stay. And uh, just uh, all my admiration is for your having that, that foresight back in 1984 as a fair newcomer to the, to the field. And we feel a loss that you moved on to do those other things, which we're going to hear about later today. But uh, thank you for your contributions in that brief, intense period. Thank you.